Well, uh, Professor Sigurd Thoralsson, you come from a region in the world which is almost a geographic laboratory because those very basic uh, uh, processes uh, shaping the earth is still going on. And to, to us in Scandinavia, of course, you personify um, Iceland in, in, in many respects, not only scientific. Um, I noticed when I li listened to your um, lecture yesterday that you mentioned in passing that your home area is up in the northeast corner of Iceland. And uh, to us, of course, this uh, seems to be a very exotic place. Uh, tell me a little about uh, your childhood and, and the environment you experienced at that time. Yes, I was born in a district called Vottnafjörður. And I passion is there. It's a rather out of way district up in North Iceland. And I think the conditions then were very similar to what they had been for the last thousand years. I sometimes say that I grew up in a Viking age and ended by training the astronauts. So that spans a lot of evolution. And when I was only two years old, my parents moved from this passionate to a little cottage nearby and there I grew up until I was 12 years, then my father died, then two brothers and three sisters and myself, we were spread over the district to various farms, because it was a poor farm. And I came back to the passionate again and uh, worked there as a shepherd and a cowboy, what you would call it, until I was 15 when I came to the grammar school. There was, in these rural districts in Iceland at that time, there were no schools at all. There were sometimes teachers that went from farm to farm, stayed for some days or weeks and taught the children. But in my case, my parents taught me what I had to learn. And then it was a custom that the clergyman, he visited every farm once a year and controlled that the children had learned what they had to learn. And uh, the clergyman where I worked, he prepared me then for the grammar school in North Iceland. Uh, where was that uh, located? That was located in Akureyri. It had just begun that school started. We had uh, earlier only one in Reykjavik and this was very lucky for boys from the countryside in North Iceland because it was much less expensive to stay there than go down to Reykjavik. So this was my luck that I came into grammar school at the age of 15. Uh, you had to live uh, in the place of the grammar school. You yes. couldn't move uh, back yes. and forth. Yes, what I had to do. But uh, I spent every summer until 19 on this farm, person farm in East Iceland, working as shepherd again. Yeah. And now, uh, 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 this um, childhood education, did it... Um, follow a certain standardized pattern oh, or was oh, yes. it only up to your parents? I was rather well prepared to enter into the second class in the grammar school. There was a six-year school. And the uh, only thing the clergyman could not teach me was mathematics. And uh, you had to stand mathematics, not to get zero in mathematics. So I had a week in Akureyri before I started school to learn so much that they could get at least one, not to be repelled from the school. And that succeeded in that. So I came into the, into the grammar school. Now we had, uh, it was about the same uh, comparable to uh, this school, comparable to what you had to learn here. It was little geography, little Danish was the only language you had to start with, and uh, natural history and so on, something from the Bible too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I was, I found that was not uh, very difficult to enter the school at that time. Of course, this, this clergyman had the best library, I think, in the private library in East Iceland, and that meant a lot for me. He had a lot of books, books of various things, and I, at that time, I, as I still do, I read practically everything I got hold of. <laughs> I remember especially the nature uh, history or so geography of what you call by Brehm. Yes, Many yes, I book yes. I read a great interest, yeah. the old, uh, old edition of that. About uh, the world's yeah. animals and so on, yeah. Uh, now, um, Iceland is known uh, as a very book-reading 
Uh, oh, it the is, yeah. There, were books, uh, there are books on most of uh, especially along the countryside. The farmers have always had a lot of literature. And uh, it was encouraged by your parents to read. I oh, think. yes. And you had, uh, it was also at, when I grew up, you, uh, in the evening, when you were people uh, working in the evening, knitting and doing wool work, then one had to read loud uh -huh. from some book. And I learned to read very young, about, it was three and a half or something. And from that, I was chosen to do that every evening in my home. In but the you, time. Yeah, but uh, how did uh, you had no electricity at that time? No. What, uh, how did you light? Well, the they house? were very primitive, primitive light. We had uh, what to call it, petrol uh -huh. lamps. Is this still uh, uh, going on like that or no? Uh, oh no, no, no. It is a great change in Iceland. It was quite modernized everything. But in my district, these things came late because of the isolation. The roads were such you did not get an auto into the district until, I think, sometime in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So we knew very little about these modern things in my, when I grew up. <coughs> uh, in this grammar school, uh, was there some um, teacher who uh, turned your interest in your certain direction? Yes, I was really not at all decided what to study further. I wanted to go abroad, that was my main intention. And in order to go get the money for that, you had to, there were two grammar schools, as I said, then you had two in each school, those who got the best character, they got the stipend to go abroad. So I was just intended to do that and then think about what to do afterwards. Oh, and when you say go abroad, what had you some specific country in mind then? Oh, it, at that time it was mainly Scandinavia, most Icelanders went to Copenhagen. Yes. That was traditional because of our connection with that country. I first thought of, of studying Latin, that was really my first I was very interested in classic languages. <coughs> and, uh, but then came a teacher, name was Hannes on Natural History. He was taught us Natural History. He was very, very inspiring. He was really a biologist, but more interested in theology. And uh, I think he was the man who inspired me to, to study natural history instead. So I went to Copenhagen and started in the autumn of 1941 with the intention of learning theology. And but in Denmark you had at that time, and maybe still first to take one year philosophy and uh, physics and chemistry. Then you had, in order to take uh, geology, you had to study both botany and zoology a little. So I started with that. But after a year, I, uh, the second, my, com my school fellow, who had the second one who got the second best character, he went to Stockholm to study Swedish. And he wrote to me in the spring of 30, and told that he had rented a hut in Örigrund for a month and wanted him to come and stay with him. And I went to Stockholm and when I came to Stockholm, this has somehow changed so he could not go to Örigrund. We went to Jämtland and wandered from Örigrund to Sturlien and then from Sturlien via Sjölan and Helax to, through Herjedalen to Dale Karlia and there we ended up in a Lead house school, I don't know the name in English, and stayed there with 80 girls two months, and they never <laughs> left Sweden. <laughs> stayed 13 years in Sweden, and have been practically everywhere in this country except in Örgrund, which was a place <laughs> I wanted to visit at the beginning. I must uh, visit that place sometime. Yes. Who was this friend? He, his name was Jon Magnusson. He studied. Uh, he studied Swedish for Professor Vessien and uh, uh -huh. later became uh, the director of the news uh, department in the radio in Iceland, instead now. Uh, now, um, when did you um, come in touch with geography? Was that in Copenhagen or not? No, in I, when, I, when I had traveled through Sweden, as I said, I found out that this was a more interesting country for uh, geologists as a plan to do it in Denmark. At that time, uh, you had not those possibilities, the Danish 
geographers and geologists have now to go to Greenland, which is the main working place now. If that had been the case, I might have stayed in Denmark. But I have found out that I would like Sweden better. And I went directly to Professor von Post. I wanted to study the quaternary geology in the beginning. And uh, went up to his office and he said, uh, said that I wanted to, to uh, study geology to him. Yes, and you will come in to Viska next summer, he said. I didn't know what Viska was, what it, it was a mountain or it was a lake or what it was, <laughs> but learned later that he was working there. And then he told me that it would be advised to take a course in this uh, elementary geodesy course you have, uh, the geographers. Mm -hmm. uh, Math while in, in math making while learning the little language and so on, the first uh, autumn. So I went to a geographical institute and that was my first contact with that institute. And then I studied really parallel these two, geography and geology, geography for Alman and geology for von Post. Took uh, three betug in both. So then you had given up uh, the biology and that's oh, sort yes, oh, of yes. it's... Uh, but I had about 10 years the third. In, in Stockholm? Yes. Yeah. Who, to, for whom? Uh, Otto Rosenberg uh -huh. was the name. Now, your, um, how did you survive, if I may say so? Did your stipend go on year after year or how? How did I? How, how did you uh, make a living? Oh, I had I this uh, for uh, five years. I had this money from Iceland. It was in the beginning only 100 Icelandic kroner per month. The Icelandic kroner was then equal to the Swedish one, yeah. which is yeah. 100 times lower now. Yeah. It was sufficient uh, for the first years. It was cheap at that time, but never had much money here at that time. No. no. Then later, when I, for example, when I had learned the pollen analysis, I worked a little, just uh, working out analysis for other people who got some money for that. And I started see. rather early writing uh, something in papers, uh -huh. small articles about Iceland and such things, to help a little on the economy. How did you uh, maintain contact with Iceland? Did you go home I in summertime? Uh, after or? the two first summers, I didn't go home. I spent one in, as I mentioned, with from Post, who was working in the Viscan district in Halland. And the second summer on a glacier <coughs> up in uh, Korsavagi, south of Abisko. Mm -hmm. Then came the third spring, and then uh, came news that an eruption had broken out in Vatnajökull. And, uh, a glacier burst, these big floods accompanying the subglacial eruption was going on. And then I suddenly wanted to go home and I left the same evening and went to Iceland. And after that I spent every summer in Iceland until the Second World War. And uh, in the summer of uh, 1936 there was an expedition to Vatnajök, a big expedition led by Alman and an Icelandic glaciologist, and he had took two of his students with him, myself and Karl Mannerfeld, mm -hmm. later mm -hmm. became the director of SLT and the well-known mm -hmm. man in the Swedish business life. And that was an the first big expedition to Vatnajök, we spent nearly the whole summer there. You see dog sledges for the first time there, and, and uh, that work. Then I continued the measurements on the glacier for the next two summers we took together with an Icelander. So that took three summers. This work. How oh, did you move uh, that time? You had to go by boat to. Iceland. We had to go by boat, yes. yes. Either via Copenhagen or usually, uh, in my case, from Bergen. There were boats from Bergen to Iceland. So it and then from Reykjavik, you had to go by Reykjavik horseback. Reykjavik by horseback. Horseback, yes. Yes, on horseback that was. Or uh, uh, partly on horseback when you went to the glaciers, of course, there, about na in 1930 you could uh, travel by bus uh, to, uh, for example, between Akureyri and Reykjavik and, and half the way along the east coast too. But when you came to the glacier rivers, they were not bridged, and then you had to take to the horse. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Uh, so you actually began with glaciology, but when did you... I started you? thinking like this. Some people are, uh, still uh, write to me as a glaciologist because I worked mainly on glaciers the first decade of my... Uh -huh. But uh, I had started already in 1930, December 1934, I first uh, witnessed the remnants of this uh, volcanic eruption and then I went up to North Iceland and happened to be an earthquake, a big earthquake there. I was near Akureyri, I was staying there and there was no one to study that, so I had to had to do that, spent uh, six weeks on that. So in a sense it was nature itself uh, which oh, invited you to study? Nature has always been my best teacher. Iceland is such a Eldorado for uh, physical geography and geology that if you only have your eyes open you can't help learning something if you are watching that. No, I see. No, but still, uh, I remember as a, as a student here, I read your your uh, Tefro chronological studies mm. and, and was very uh, impressed by this combination you made. Uh, it was very intriguing of um, uh, soil science, mm. pollen analysis, Tefro uh, chronology and uh, settlement history and the saga uh, mm -hmm. sources and so on. I think that approach may be rather typical Icelandic, uh, at least uh, the old, my generation and the older ones uh, who studied natural history, there were a lot of humanists as well. And this interest in uh, volcanic ash layers started already in 19, uh, summer of 1934. I wanted, I had then studied pollen analysis from post and, and uh, no pollen analysis had been made in Iceland, so I took uh, he drilled with me and uh, wanted to take samples. And I soon found out when I started pollen analysis in Iceland, we had only one sort of tree, we had only birds, we could not uh, get the fine diagrams you got here. But immediately when you start drilling through a bog in Iceland, you met these layers, some black layers, some dark layers, and I found out very soon that they would be very good key horizons to connect one bog with another. So I started to uh, study this closer and it gradually became an aim in itself. I wanted to get the dates of some of this layer before I started pollen analysis, but it has taken this 40 years to <laughs> work this out. So I did only a few pollen diagrams. There was another man who later uh, made what I intended to do with pollen and but could then use this layers with a very good as horizon. So I started studying the volcanic history of Iceland. And as I, I can say that I, my, the ash, ash layers of volcanic eruption influenced my fate nearly before I was born. There was a very big eruption in northeast Iceland in 1875 in the volcano Askja in Iceland. It was one of the biggest explosive eruptions uh, we have had in the last thousand years. And the ash spread as far as uh, Sweden. It fell in Stockholm to such a degree that the light was obscured a little and people became very interested. It was mapped, the first big layer to be mapped, uh, the ex extension of it was mapped. It was Adolf Erik Nordenskjöld who did this because he was then in very interested in cosmic dust and regarded this in the beginning as a cosmic dust, but then came the news from the Iceland that this was not from heaven as Northern Shield thought. It came from a crater that happens to have the name of Viti, which means hell. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, my grandfather lived in a farm in a valley called Jökuldalur. It was a district nearest to this volcano. And all the farms in the inner part of these valleys, they had to be uh, evacuated because Asle was up to 20, 30 centimeters thick there. And they all left the farms, but my uh, grandfather, he had to stay some weeks because his wife got the son two weeks after the eruption began, but they had to wait until he was some weeks old and then he fled also like the others to a district Vaknafjörður where he then settled down. So he never born. went back to He this. never went back. It was destroyed. 
most of the people went to America uh, who were in this district, but he stayed in that other district and where I grew up, yeah. was born here. So you are really personally affected <laughs> by, by Volcano, that? Oh yes, uh, from the <laughs> beginning, but my uh, scientific contact with volcanoes came through glaciology as there are, uh, there are uh, so many active volcanoes under the ice cover, also under the ice cover of Vatnajökull. And in 1936, when we were working there, measuring the accumulation and ablation, we used the ash layer from 1936, from the eruption, 1934, as a key horizon to find the uh, surface of the 19, uh, eruption, or in April yeah. 1934. And this thin black layer was excellent to, to uh, state the surface of the 1934. Mm -hmm. So when you entered into settlement history, you had already uh, this way of thinking? Yes, that. yes. And uh, Iceland is, uh, I think uh, there are a few countries when you can apply this, uh, you use this as layers better than in Iceland, partly because we have very well recorded volcanic history for the last thousand years, only in the Mediterranean, you have records that date much further back. In Japan, they date about to, uh, the same, same length back to the 8th, 9th century. Then you have a very rapid soil thickening in Iceland, so that every, if you have only a few years difference in age of an ash layer, you can see that in the soil profiles. But this is partly because of a cold climate, so the box uh, thicken rapidly, and uh, also, the dry soil, the lusial soil we have, it thickens rapidly because of the wind erosion. Wind erosion in one place means a thickening of the soil in another place where the material is deposited. Mm -hmm. uh, to begin with, you must have s had some difficulties with the dating. Oh, yes, but uh, it was really first in 1939 that I really started the dating. Then was a big Nordic archaeological expedition to a deserted valley in Iceland, Thjossordal, where Martin Stinberg from Sweden and a Danish archaeologist went from Finland and then Icelanders. Among them young archaeologists who later became the president of Iceland, Christian Eldio. And I, as this valley was destroyed by volcanic eruption, that was known, but not to which eruption. So I was spent the summer there with the archaeologists trying to date these farms and uh, came to the conclusion that it was a Hecla eruption, big eruption in the year 1300 uh, AD. Later, and that I stated in my doctor thesis later. But had later, when I came back after the war, I had to change that to the first Hecla eruption in 1104. In between, we had a big Hecla eruption in 1947, the big, one of the biggest in history, and uh, I studied uh, that eruption. I thoroughly spent most of the time. It lasted 13 months. And this eruption taught me more about volcanoes than I had learned before. And uh, from that experience, I gradually found out that it must be a so-called initial eruption that uh, made this layer that buried Thjorsdaler Valley. So you have actually been um, witness of uh, a series of eruptions. And yeah, to I was. Uh, we were. It started early in the morning on 29th of, of March 1947, and I was there in an airplane only a few hours later. And since then, I happened to be at home every time there has been an eruption in Iceland, being in the first plane on the first car. Now that was some years ago. A very dramatic thing happening two new, or perhaps three new islands outside yes. the coast, you got involved in that. That started in uh, the, this uh, island, the birth of this island was in, on the 14th of November, or 15th of November, the island really was born 1963, south of the Westman Island. I was, they woke me up from the weather bureau and told me at uh, four o'clock in the, five in the morning that there was an eruption there was something happened south of the Westman Island. They said water spouts, high water spouts, and I told them they asked them if they had never watched a blowing whale. 
and then <laughs> went to sleep again. But some quarter of an hour later, they phoned and said that it was black things coming up into the air. I saw it in the half darkness from a fishing boat, and then I started immediately, and it was an eruption. And the following night, the island was born, later to be named Sutse, after the giant of fire in the old Norse mythology, Surtur, comes from the south with the fire. This was, this eruption lasted with the interruptions um, from 63 to 67. Maybe the most interesting eruption I have watched, and it was very easy to watch it. You could stay on boats, sailing around, uh, staying comfortably on a boat, which you usually cannot do if you are walking in the inland desert of Iceland. And it's more difficult to watch an eruption in a way. So uh, we spent months on Coast Guard vessels watching this island growing up. Have you followed uh, the development now, the invasion of organisms? Yes, so. of course, I, I, yes, that is not my field, but it is followed very closely. From uh, At the moment, this island is interesting mainly from two points of view, from geomorphological, because all the forms start from zero, so to say. You know how it was in the very beginning. Uh, for example, the shore development, how you gradually build up a cliff uh, instead of a slope, even slope you had in the beginning. That is now followed by a Swedish geomorphology, John Norman, mm -hmm. because I had no time to do it, so it's aerial photographed every year, the island, <coughs> so you can make a map, and he comes every second year and makes some detailed mapping. I am personally working a little still on the wind erosion there and the water erosion on the island itself. But uh, the biologists are, of course, very interested in following the development of life mm. Mm. with both plants and animal life, bird life and so on. So the island, it, it is strictly forbidden to go to the island except uh, for scientists who have to be rather careful about not contaminating the, and uh, influencing this evolution. This is very interesting to follow. I remember one of the things that impressed me most and having worked on these islands for the first years, that was the first flower. You walked on this absolute desert and uh, suddenly you see a little white flower, mm -hmm. a in maritima, in this black desert. This uh, plant had, uh, you had seen this plant for two summers. That already in the th uh, second summer you found some green plants. Then came the second island started and everything was covered with ash or tephra, a new, everything died out. Next summer the plant came again, then started the third island, and the uh, third summer it succeeded. Mm. The curious thing was, you was always certain, it seemed a very uneven fight between the plant and the volcano, but uh, you were certain who would win in the end, that was a curious thing. In a, in a sense, it's almost symbolic of the colonization of, is, of, of Iceland, isn't it? Oh, it is. People coming so from Norway. So it is, yeah, it's yes, trying, it's studied you know. everything, also microbiology and uh, bacteria, everything is studied very closely, mainly Americans mm. who studied this, but the insect life, that, that was a group from here, from Lund. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, let's uh, go back to the war years. I understand you spent them in Sweden. Yes, I was uh, caught up by the war. I, I was then, uh, I came in the autumn of 19, uh, summer 1939. I spent in Iceland. And then I came back and wanted to stay for a while. I was then engaged to a Swedish girl, Inga von Backlund sister of the now Swedish ambassador in Bonn, St. Backland. <laughs> but then we was cut from the Iceland for some years, couldn't go back. So I, instead of doing something, I first worked on the road uh, department by best school, mm -hmm. and then on a, an lexicon, Bonnius conversational lexicon for some years. And uh, in the meantime, I do something, I wrote my doctor thesis. 
felt very badly that I was isolated from my homeland. Because... Yeah, uh, you had uh, enough um, uh, data sources. Yeah, I had then what the summer before 1939 in this Thursday Valley. Yeah. And what had that material uh, dating of this eruption, but I uh, the whole time had a little uneasy feeling that uh, I should have had little more, more profiles and spread it over bigger areas. So the first thing I did when I came back was to start this again, try to, if we could correct it or find it, although I was in the beginning I was certain that I was right. But uh, I succeeded in going back in the last war year, came by one of the Swedish uh, planes that went to England, I succeeded in coming there and then, then in a convoy to Iceland. It was rather dramatic travel. We five boats started, two came to Iceland. I was one, <laughs> on one of these two. <laughs> But I said, okay, we came back in the 44. Now, um, you mentioned yesterday in your lecture that uh, you talked about yourself as a nature scientist, and I suppose that's true, but still, uh, uh, this book uh, you wrote here has a, a rather humanistic flavor at mm -hmm. the you same are. time. I have always been interested in these things, so... Uh, it fits me well to, to combine this, and I am, have been interested in volc volcanoes and glaciers mainly as a part of the milieu of the people living there. Uh, my interest in the volcanoes has been just as much how has the volcanic activity act, uh, affected this isolated population, and how has the climatic have the climatic changes as indicated by the glacier oscillation, how have they affected this? Population. Iceland has this is isolated island, as you know, and this uh, fight against ice and fire has meant a lot for the history of people, I think. Mm -hmm. And there's a unique opportunity to study this in so an isolated environment. Mm -hmm. And that's why no, I'm uh, interested, and uh, therefore I'm glad that I, I <laughs> for example, that I learned that Latin by my clergyman in all time, and even a little Greek. That have helped me at least to coin this term tephra. I could found it by Aristotle. Yes. He had used it <laughs> once upon a time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I adopted it to find a uh, collective term for uh, tephra, for uh, all volcanic uh, material that goes, is airborne. We have lava for the flowing material. We have magma for the primary material both uh, really originally the Greek words, and I wanted a short Greek term also for the outthrown material. And I found that in the oldest description you have of an eruption in history, uh, at least in the Western world, is by Aristotle. And he uses the word tephra, which really means ash, normal ash, uh, used, used the word tephra. I remember some years ago I was lecturing down in Athene, and uh, the Greek geologists, they thought it was unnecessary to start uh, new terms for things, and I had to tell them that it was their own Aristotle that <laughs> coined it 2,400 years ago. Good. Yeah, you know, we have had a lot of uh, specialization now in science and even in mm. geography, but you seem to me to be uh, uh, <coughs> proof that a broadness is possible. What is your attitude to the development of the discipline now? I am a little... Uh, I am a little... Uh, I don't like this, uh, what is going on uh, yeah, here in Scandinavia, at least, that uh, geography is... Uh, does uh, not uh, keep its integrity. It is mixed up in uh, with other... Discipline. I think geography is a rather necessary thing to have, it's just in a time of specialization. There needs to have some discipline that can uh, uh, combine a lot of disciplines. I find that there are a lot of problems that cannot be solved the other way. There are always problems you have can only solve by specialists, but there are other problems you can only solve by having the rather broad view, I think. Mm. So I so think you, it's you rather have, necessary. You have felt happy with being... I have felt happy, yes, but I... Of course, you want to be a spe specialist in some details, so that you can understand how specialists work. But and 
I sometimes regret that I I may be a little too broad and a little too shallow. <laughs> but still I'm rather happy about about it but because the new generation in my country they are mostly just specialists to know only everything about the small thing but not they have have this no do not have this broad view of things. No, but you think it's still necessary to I think it's uh, I think uh, it is necessary. I think it really is necessary and maybe more necessary than before because when the specialists get more and more uh, their fields get more and more narrow, I think there is still more need for some people to keep that old uh, broad uh, view of the things. I really think so. I understand that your interests are still broader. You have uh, even uh, written poetry and so on. No poetry. You should not mix poetry with, with songs or verse, or as you call it in Swedish. That was my hobby in olden days to to write or translate, translated lot of every to translate Bellman and so on to Icelandic and. Yeah. Uh, just this, that could, just this type of song, drinking songs and other, but I have given it up. So it's not so an uh, Icelandic uh, I- I- no, I- no. tradition, it's a trans- No, no, no. It's you know, both yeah, translations and, uh, and also some original ones. And uh, some of them happen to be sung a lot in Iceland, so I, I think for a while I was better known for them than the geology. <laughs> Now, uh, did you make uh, melodies yourself? Or Only in a few cases, usually, took songs that have melodies. For example, yeah. in the case of Torben Bellman. Uh-huh. Or used this me- their melodies like for other texts. Fitted to Icelanders. Good. Icelanders sing a lot, and especially, formerly, in this long travels in buses, everyone was singing and uh, needed a lot of songs, I think. You don't like to give us a, a, an example of one of these, uh, your own <laughs> work. I don't, I really don't think so. I usually do not sing in the morning. <laughs> See, uh, and it was, it was mainly many of them, as I said, uh, drinking songs that you used earlier in Sweden. I think you were giving it up a little, but in my time you hardly had that post-seminar or anything without yeah. some drink and some singing. Uh, you have been instrumental in the building up of uh, 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 the University of Reykjavik, haven't you? Yes. And uh, I suppose you have some student life and beginning to, to grow there. Oh yes, there are very, very many. We started, in, uh, stud, uh, started teaching natural history only t- 12 years ago, geology botany and so on and so on. Before that we sent all our students abroad. But then we started and uh, since then the number for example geologists and geophysicists have grown very rapidly. We have uh, about 100 geoscientists at the moment. We had about 10 when we started. And we have a lot staying abroad. There are two taking their doctor degree here in Lund at the moment for example. Of Jan Berlin. Uh-huh. Have you managed to uh, maintain also kind of unified uh, geography? At the oh yes, university? I think we will uh, save geography somehow a little better than here. People are very interested in these things in Iceland, geography and geology. And uh, I hope we will succeed in keeping your geography on our some tolerably high level. Of course we have in what we in Iceland there is always both in teaching and anywhere there is a lack of manpower. <coughs> yeah, there's a lack of teachers, especially in physical geography. We would badly need some uh, good teacher. Um, I guess this broad perspective needs uh, intuition. You need to develop uh, a way of looking at things which differs a little bit from uh, from uh, normal routine science. Mm, yes, uh, we we'll probably do so. 
But in Iceland, this is rather natural, as I said, as our history is so influenced by these things, by the milieu and by the changing milieu. We are so sensitive to this in this country, for example, when drift ice starts now again to approach our coasts. So it is very natural to, uh, uh, to combine at least history uh, with the geography and geology. Uh, it's more natural than in many other countries where you are not so influenced uh, by these changes, big towns. Uh, and uh, where the climatic safety marginal is broader than by us. Yeah, yeah. So you can, uh, it is, I think, it's more natural approach with us than in many other countries. So uh, you mean that the discipline is sort of shaped by the, uh, I think, the necessities of the I environment? I would uh, think in Iceland there will always be some who, who would have to combine this thing, all of the specialized. Of course, when I'm I, uh, now in my older days, when I uh, do less and less field work, then uses uh, your time more to uh, work out, for example, a history of volcanoes, climate history, and so on, where you can do uh, without going into the field. Uh, is that what you have been working on now in yes, Copenhagen? Yes, that is a typical example uh, I am working on. Uh, we had the biggest eruption, lava eruption, recorded in the world in history in Iceland in 1783. It was a 25-kilometer long uh, fissure that opened up, and, and the lava issued from that uh, fissure covered about 560 square kilometers. And the volume is about 10 cube kilometers. It is 10 times bigger than, uh, let's say, the biggest eruptions in Hawaii, which in their turn are 10 times bigger than normal eruptions in the Mediterranean and other countries. So this was a tremendous amount of lava and, uh, and uh, a tremendous amount of gases was released, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and uh, sulfur compounds. Well, say approximately 20 million tons of carbon dioxide. And this uh, formed a bluish haze that spread all over Iceland and stunted the grass crop so that uh, the result that about 75% of the entire livestock, cattle, horses and sheep perished. And as a result of that again, about 22% of the population died of starvation. And this Lewis haze spread over the Atlantic and uh, started to be felt in Europe. This eruption started on Whitsuntide, 8th of June, and uh, about the 16th, 17th of June, this haze began to be felt in Northwest Europe. And it gradually spread eastwards, and by the end of by 25th, 25th of June, it had reached Moscow and 1st of July, it had reached Altai Mountains in Siberia, to mention an example. And this caused a lot of discussion here in, U in Europe <coughs> among scientists. What was written about it in the Western Europe, the leaves fell from the trees and the grass became yellow and so on. And sulfur, the smell the sulfur. And I've tried to follow this both in the newspapers and the scientific papers from that time. And now I'm lucky again to be able to read Latin and these languages, Latin, because it's in Latin, French, German, Italian, and so on, you have to. And uh, I feel in my age, I would rather do things that I can do better than my young colleagues at home and let them do things that I can do better than I myself working with the new sophisticated instruments. Well, that sounds like a good statement for ending this discussion. I thank you very much for spending this time with me, and I hope that you have not got up for too long time, <laughs> so you no. can get on to, to the next eruption. <laughs> I hope it will.